Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, brethren and sistren, to the Tawahedo Bible Study Podcast. Today we are in the second scroll of Peter, or the Rock, chapter 3. This is not only the concluding chapter of the second scroll, but you can say the concluding chapter of this set of two Petrine writings or scrolls or scriptures in the first place. Wherever you are, if you're in YouTube, if you're on Transistor or Apple or Spotify, make sure you subscri subscribe to this program. Make sure you share the words of God and maybe even the links to this program with your friends, enemies, and strangers. And make sure that if you are able, you can donate at patreon.com slash tawahedo. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash tawahedo. All right, Second Peter chapter 3. Today I'll be reading from the Greek Orthodox Bible, which is a New Testament prepared by some of the Greeks. This is now, beloved, the second letter that I have written to you, and in both of them I stir up your sincere mind by reminding you that you should remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior given through your apostles. So in the first two verses, we find out that instead of just sending a voice note or the equivalent, which could have been a messenger to just go say something, the apostle Peter or the apostle The Rock decides to send people and decides to consign a written word and to have that written word read aloud or recited to this community. Now, why he chooses to do that, I'm going to let you come to your own conclusions, but I would like to suggest that it's because he held it in a little bit higher importance. And because, as it says here, he is an apostle, he is one who's sent forth, he is a lackey, he is a minion of the Savior. Remember, Jesus means the tetragram saves. Yahweh saves. Edonai, or the Lord, saves. So the Savior, he who saves, is Jesus. And he who saves commissioned the apostles. He sent them on a mission. He had them do his bidding. And the bidding he had has to do with love. And we'll see that explanation throughout this chapter. Verses 3 to 7. First of all, know that in the last days, mockers will come, walking after their own lusts. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Since the days that our forefathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But they willfully forget that in the old days, there were the heavens and the earth, formed out of water and through water, by the word of God, by means of these, the world of old was flooded with water and perished. But by his word, the heavens and the earth that exist now have been reserved for the fire of the day of judgment and for the destruction of those who are ungodly. There's a great psalm chant in the Good is Right tradition that my brother Deacon Alamayo prepared, and you could find it on YouTube somewhere under Gen Next Ethiopians. And it begins like this. We went through fire and water, and yet you... So we went through fire and water. These elemental forces of nature, of the universe, of the cosmos can seem scary. A lot of people can die in a forest fire or later on, as we'll see, in a flood. But these things are under the control of God, who is always in control, no matter how chaotic the situation or the circumstance before us seems. Within water and within fire, you have death and you have life. Water 
can give you one of the most brutal deaths ever, a drowning. But it could also, uh, it, or uh, not, not it could also, it is also the very means by which you have life, right? Um, in Zoolander, I believe they they popularized the phrase "water is life" in one of those commercials where he's a merman, and there's a debate around that. Fire is like that as well. A blazing flame is very troublesome for you. It's why we have fire departments and firefighters to take care of them. At the same time, fire is what we need to cook meat, especially in a time of plague and pandemic. You really want to cook your meat if you're eating meat to make sure that you're protecting yourself maximally from the bacteria. In any event, there is death and there is life. There is destruction and there is salvation. But in the hands of the Savior, everything is a okay so there are these mockers these scoffers and they are casting their doubt because judgment hasn't happened yet and they're saying why hasn't judgment happened why hasn't judgment happened let's not listen to these apostles and their savior because judgment hasn't happened yet we'll find the answer in verses 8 to 10. Beloved, do not forget that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some people think that he is. Instead, he is patient with us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and in this day, the heavens will pass away with a rushing noise. The elements will be dissolved by intense heat. And the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Here, the apostle Peter, great Jew that he is, quotes from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, specifically from the wisdom literature or the ketuvim, the writings. More specifically, from the tehelim, from the Psalms. Psalm 89, according to the Greek text, the OG, the Old Greek, and Psalm 90, according to the MT, the Masoretic text. So in Psalm 89 or Psalm 90, you find the same thing. One day is a thousand years. Is this a math formula? No, it's not a math formula. What this is, is that it's saying, just like in the basics of science, the basics of astronomy, you may find out that a day on Earth is different than a day on Venus, is different than a day on Mars, is different than a day on Pluto, the beloved ice dwarf or planet, I'll let you decide. And so if all of these days are different, what, pray tell, what, pray tell, is the length of a day to God? It's unknown to us. It's unbeknownst to us. And so we cannot operate calling God slow, or calling God fast. Instead, we need to act patiently because he's granted us patience. He's shown us his forbearance like somebody who is delaying the payments that you owe on your student loans. He's giving us a chance, another opportunity, a kiros to repent, to radically reorient to change our ways, to do an about face, a 180 turn, and to begin walking towards him unto eternity, unto the end of the cosmos that are prophesied here in this chapter. Verses 11 to 13. Therefore, since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be in terms of holy living and godliness? You should look for and eagerly desire the coming of the day of God, which will cause the burning heavens to be dissolved and the elements to melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness is at home. Would you rather live at home with unrighteousness or with righteousness? If it is with righteousness that you want to be at home, then you need to show eagerness 
for the coming of the Lord, eagerness for judgment day. That may sound contradictory. That may sound paradoxical. It may sound like there's a tension there. But if we want to follow the path of the apostles, we must be eager for judgment. We must attend to the public recitation of scripture. We must remember the widow and the orphan. We must act not as owners of property, but of stewards of the property of God. For we own nothing, and the earth and the fullness thereof are the property of God. Verses 14 to 18. Therefore, beloved, as you look for these things, do your utmost to be found in peace, without blemish and blameless in his sight. Consider the patience of our Lord as salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom given to him. He does so in all his letters, speaking of these things. However, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they also do with the other scriptures. Beloved, since you know these things in advance, be careful and fear that being carried away with the error of the wicked, you might fall from your own secure position. Instead, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and unto ages of ages. Amen. Father Paul Nadim Tarazi makes this point often, but you can probably get to the same point independently. The church is Petrine and Pauline, and he emphasizes the Pauline. And here we see Peter scripturalizing Paul way before Nicaea and Constantinople, let alone Ephesus and Chalcedon. And after that, we hear talk of us having a secure position. This is what B Bishop Callistos Ware would talk about as our past salvation or Christ's salvation of us, deliverance and rescue of us in the past. The labor of love he did for us with the cross, which we could not earn except with his. So in the present, as we await the future, hope and confidence in salvation in the present, we must continue in love. We must continue in following the path of the apostles. I hope you had a blessed feast and culmination of the fast of the apostles with the blessed feast of the apostle Paul and the apostle Peter. Glory to God for all things.